people said, you don't want to be an architect. Architects don't make any money. It's true. It, people who told me that were honest and truthful. You want to become a lawyer, an accountant, a doctor, something that has more stability. We have done much more than $36 billion worth of real estate development through the years. I was supposed to go to Libya to work in Libya for Gaddafi. I believe that architecture is nothing more than a backdrop to the natural environment. I think that the natural environment is the most important thing that you can do. Was there like a pivotal moment where you looked at your wife and said like, holy shit, like we made it. Hello and welcome back to the Rise podcast where we explore the life stories of accomplished individuals. Today we have with us uh, the one and only Kobe Carp. Kobe, thank you for taking this. Uh, it's very gracious of you knowing that this is the third time I'm doing this. I'm new to this. My wife is the professional, but you've been kind enough to, to allow me to be here. So um, your accolades, which span the last three decades, um, is going to take me a little bit of time to go over uh, because I did my research. And so you're gonna have to bear with me. So before Kobe even says a word, I'm gonna go through this. So everybody who's watching understands who this gentleman is. Before I go into your, uh, your accolades, you know, I can say that everywhere I go in this city, I keep seeing your name. Not hearing your name, although I hear your name too. I keep seeing your name because your name is literally on half of the buildings in this city, whether they've already been designed by you or they're in the midst of being designed by you. So if you're not from Miami, if you're from Miami, you know the name Kobe Carp. If you travel anywhere within the city, if you're not from Miami, um, Kobe's continuously designing half the city. So let me get into it. So over the last two decades, uh, Kobe Carp architecture and, architecture and interior design has completed over 1,000 projects in more than 20 countries with a focus on hospitality, retail, commercial, um, high-rise, mixed-use, multifamily, and residential projects. Now, Kobe, I'll, I'll, I'd like for you to interject here because I read a stat, and I'm not sure if it's correct because it sounds astronomical to me. If you aggregate the total costs of the projects, of these 1,000 projects you've done throughout your career, we're looking at a cost of $36 billion. Is that, did I understand that correctly or did I not understand that correctly? No, you understood that correctly. Number one, thank you so much, Gary. Number, thank you so much for having me here. It's a real pleasure. It's an honor to be here with you. I'm happy that I'm number three. I like to be <laughs> number three, especially behind your boss. Yes. Um, so really what I think there is, there is a unique, um, interesting that these numbers are just hypothetical. Because as inflation goes up, the numbers go up. But in reality, over the years, we have done much more than $36 uh, billion worth of real estate development through the years. And it's um, interesting that it's both domestic and international. As, as far as the Far East, I know that I yes. read that you're in, I believe, was it Abu Dhabi, Dubai, UAE? Yes, I have been a resident of Abu Dhabi, the UAE, since 2005. We have done projects in the UAE as well as in Bahrain, uh, Doha, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia. We have a hotel right now under construction in Mecca, a kilometer and a half away from the Kaaba. It's a Copthorne Millennium Hotel. We have done projects in Cape Town, South Africa, across Anmuli Point beautiful destination across from the lighthouse. We've done projects in Russia, Romania, uh, Israel. So we have been very lucky to work internationally. Really the reason I came to Florida originally in 1988, which was Miami Vice and Scarface days. Yes. I'll give you a little video pictorial, which is substantially different than what it is that Florida is today, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, completely unique and different. But we came here to have a base here in Miami, specifically on Lincoln Road. We're in the Sterling Building at 925 Lincoln Road. Mm -hmm. And we serviced the Caribbean. We work in the Caribbean. We work in the British West Indies, in Mastique, St. Lucia, Grenada, Turks and Caicos, the Bahamas, Jamaica. 
And that's where most of our work was in the late 80s and early 90s. How do you, how do you keep all these projects straight in your head? I mean, you're, like, how many projects do you have ongoing at any given time? Like right now, like how many projects do you have? I don't know the number um, and I don't count because it's bad luck. <laughs> how, many, how, many, how many people work on this? Like how many architects do you have here? Arch bis just the architects because it's always a collaboration with engineers, and interior designers. How many so, employees do you have? Sorry. I have in this company right now about 90 plus employees that work in the office, um, outside the office, uh, surrounding the area. Um, we have a project right now ongoing, mostly in South Florida. Yeah. Yet we just finished a project in El Paso, Texas, a historic preservation restoration of a major hotel. So, I mean, names like Four Seasons, um, yes. Four Seasons Surfside, Four Seasons Fort Lauderdale, yes. both the Four Seasons, yes. uh, one hotel in Miami Beach. Yes. We, we could we could do we could literally do a whole episode just talking about all the projects that you've done. I want to I want to provide a little more context that I think only people who have met you have about you specifically, and then I really want to go into your story and I want to get into your early life because the premise of this podcast is to give the listeners real perspective into accomplished people and so rather than lecturing at people oh you got to hustle you got to do this you got to do that i really want to examine and dissect individuals like yourself to understand kind of the the challenges you've had along the way but before we get into that um you and i met um i don't know if you remember you probably you do you do remember i'm sure you do remember so you and i met maybe a, a couple of months after i arrived to miami probably about a month after we decided we're going to move here after just coming here for vacation and then deciding we're staying and we met at uh, it was one of valeria's friends and you were there and i remember we met and you found out that we had just arrived uh, and that we're new to the country and you said to me like a lot of people say you know if you need anything here's my number call me and like many people now, when you and I met, I didn't know who you were. And then I obviously Googled you. And then I paid attention to all the signs on the street. And I realized who Kobe Karp is. And what's interesting is that about a year after that, you and I didn't talk for a year. And I was trying to, I was feverishly trying to, Blair and I were feverishly trying to purchase a house here. And there was a house that we went into contract with, but there were like huge issues with permits and the city and whatnot. And I remember Valeria saying, just message Kobe. And I said, Valeria, like, first of all, Kobe's a very busy man. And second of all, he met me a year ago. There's no way Kobe remembers me. She goes, what have you got to lose? Message him. I message you. <laughs> Guys, I just want the audience to understand. Kobe responded to me probably within 18 seconds saying, hi, Gary, how are you? Great to hear from you. Yes, of course. What do you need? I, prov I proceeded to explain to you what I needed. You in detail made, I think, three or four different introductions to people who could get everything done for me. And, and, and it went from there. Furthermore, any time since then that I've needed anything, your response to this podcast, you, you, within 10 seconds, you responded, yes. So that's the kind of person that, that you are. And I just, I wanted to point that out because I think that the perception that the general kind of public that, you know, people at large have, of uh, people who are accomplished is that they're arrogant and they're jerks. And that's just simply not, that's probably the case with most people, but it's certainly not the case with you. So I just wanted to provide that context. Take me back to, I know you were born in Israel, and I know you moved from Israel to the United States when you were 11. Tell me about kind of where you came from in terms of your early kind of, you know, your childhood in Israel and the circumstances under which you grew up. So number one, I'm very happy that you told me that little story because it means that you follow rule number one, which is your wife, your boss is always right. <laughs> and then you can follow on to rule number two, and the rule number two is always follow rule number one. <laughs> but Valeria was right. Um, I, if you, I'm the kind of individual that I believe in helping people all the time. And it can be anybody. Um, I believe that assisting people and doing good for and with people is what gives me from a selfish standpoint the most satisfaction and that comes back in life to pay back in multiple ways personal professional health um, wellness and so to be good and to do good um, is in my observation 
uh, not just me, but people who also follow that kind of a thought process, is a very healthy, good way to go through life. Um, it's a short life we have here. Yeah. I'm 60 years old today, so I have... Today? I mean, to date. Oh, sorry. I, <laughs> sorry. I turned 60, <laughs> I thank you, on November 1, 1960. Okay, I thought we arrived on your birthday. <laughs> oh I would have brought you a cake. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Gary. But I think that it gets back to the point of what you are trying to figure out and what this podcast and this thought process is about, is that if you can find a way to assist most of the people most of the time because you can't make all of the people happy all of the time mm -hmm. that's a, that's Im an impossibility but if you can make most of the people happy most of the time and you can find a way to do it that is most appreciated the way i do it is in my what i love to do which is design construction architecture uh, master planning and my thinking as an architect is also different and unique in that it is that I think what is the benefit that I can do not only to my client, the developer, who is then I work really for the brokers who sell and list mm -hmm. and lease. Uh, that's, the for, that's for single family homes? Single family, multifamily condos, mm -hmm. multifamily rentals. When you rent a building, whether it's an affordable housing or workforce housing, or a market rate rental, or a luxury rental, or a luxury condominium, even though it's designed for different individuals with different financial capabilities, the basics have to be substantially the same. And that is what we strive to do. That's what I strive to do. I strive to give an affordable housing that I have done, like Lyric Plaza in Overtown. Your, you, you know, your kind of way of life in terms of being kind to people like you were to me to a stranger who had just arrived yes. to the country um do you feel that that's one of the things that you've been doing consistently since your yes. early days and is that something that's led to your success yes 100 percent. So take take me back to israel take you back to israel take I was me back born to israel. in 1962 and i'll give you an example when i was i don't know 10 11 years old i used to have a, a bicycle you know with the little clip on the back that you hold down the mm -hmm. bags yeah yeah and on holidays, I would deliver flowers. So there was a flower shop down the street from my home. I lived in a small town called Netanya. It, and, and Israel in 1960s, 1970s is different than it is today, like most places. But specifically, it was mostly pedestrian friendly and bicycle friendly. And I would ride my bicycle and deliver flowers. I would deliver flowers on holidays. For the florist you did it? For or? the florist. Okay. And they would pay me some money, but you would get a tip. And I remember certain events, like I, would, I delivered these red roses, big red roses, you know. And, and so it was a unique delivery because most people don't have much money, especially mm -hmm. Israelis back then. But it was to a hotel. It was to an American family. I guess the husband bought it for the wife. Three dozen roses. I'm delivering. It's a big bundle on the back of the bicycle. And I'm getting to the hotel in Israel. And I go up the steps and I deliver it to them. And... And, and the daughter comes out, and she's like my age, 10, 11. And, and she says, because she spoke English, so one second, my mom is coming, and the mother comes, and she saw the flowers. She was happy. The flowers were bigger than me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she gives me a tip. And she gives me a $5 tip, right? And $5 US, not shekels. 5 US. Okay. And the bill and the way it feels and the way it looks, it was the first time I saw it, it makes you... It's just the way you look at the pictorial on it, right? And you understand it later on in life. It just, it was a big moment, right? And the smile on the woman's face by delivering the flowers. So when you do things, even indirectly, I'm just a flower boy, and you bring it to people. It's like a food delivery when you, today, when people, everybody orders their food every day. But if you make that delivery and you look somebody in the eye and you give them the food, when they eat the food, they will feel better. If you deliver the food and you leave it on the step, it's one thing. But if you have an opportunity to deliver the food and give somebody in the eye, whether it's the food or it's a tip, it makes people feel completely different. When I used to wait on restaurants when I came to the United States of America, mm -hmm. when I was... You're getting ahead of yourself. I'm sorry. It's I'll okay. That's okay. No, because I really want to, I want to establish and understand the circumstances because I think, I think I know, 
I think I know, you know, growing up in the 60s as a child in Israel, in, in, in Net, uh, Net, Netan, Netanya, Netanya um, you know, getting that $5 bill for the first time, I'm trying to establish the fact that I don't believe you came from a, like a very financially affluent family, is my no, guess. I came from a working class family. W my, what did your parents do? My father was an accountant which he was quite he was a grinder like me so mm -hmm. he was quite successful the business of in the city was basically tourism that they were building hotels yeah how about were, how about your mom what did your mom do my mom was a, a housekeeper mm -hmm. full-time she worked with my father she was always working with so i had working parents and um, they didn't sorry they weren't they weren't, I believe, born in Israel, because no. I think everybody at that point, because Israel was only established in the 40s? 48. Or 48. My father was born in Poland. Okay. And came to Israel when he was approximately 10 years old. Okay. My mom was born in Romania, and she was, she's two years younger than him, and they came there at the same time. They met, they met in Israel? They met in Israel. Um, he was, they were working later on in life, right? And in, 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 when they came as kids, they all lived in a little tents because mm -hmm. they put everybody in tents um they later on they were working in the same building my mom was an administrator working for a bank my father was an accountant running up and down the staircase and as he tells her one day i ran in and she was there and i met her in the building and that's when they fell in love and and the rest is history do you do you have siblings i have two sisters um who are uh, live here in florida one is uh, two years younger and one is um, eight years younger than me. At, at what point did you want to be more in the sense that you wanted to excel? I don't want to say entrepreneur because I don't, your path, you didn't go straight into being an entrepreneur. You were a scholar. So I guess my question is, you know, coming from the humble home that you did with your father as an accountant and your mother as a housekeeper, what was it in that kind of in that uh, scenario that made young Kobe say, you know what, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to, you know, get an education that will allow me to reach these huge heights. Like, what was it? Like, did your parents say to you, like Kobe, like there's more than this? What was what was that catalyst? That 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 mindset. How did you acquire this mindset? So I think it was evolutionary. I don't think it was, I can't point to one point in time and say when it happens, although I can point to points in life as I went along that I learned and I observed that money is not everything. On the contrary, if you spend too much time chasing the money, it burns the most valuable commodity that you can potentially have, time. which is time. And if you like or you love what you do, I get up in the morning when I love what I do, and I've always loved what I've done. Meaning before I was an architect, I studied environmental design. Before I studied environmental design, I worked in the field of construction and hospitality. That's where I learned hospitality and service, and I worked in construction because there was no work for architects in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the office. But before you get to Minneapolis, so what... What was, what was that? How did you leave Israel? So at 11, I'm assuming you didn't leave by yourself. So you left with your parents. I left with my, my parents uh, left. My parents went to New York in 1972. Okay. Which in 1972, the economy of Israel was booming. It was way up. Why'd they leave? Um, give me a second. Sorry. So he's so I'm just he, eager. He's to, so I'm, impatient. No, I'm just, I'm eager because so, it's such an interesting story. Yeah. So what happens is that 1972, my parents went to, my father was the youngest of nine. He went to visit his sister, the oldest of nine. She married an American GI to live in uh, Brooklyn on Ocean Parkway. And as you can imagine, 1972 in New York was not good no. at all. Um, there was garbage in the streets. There was crime everywhere. The AC was not working. The TV was disconnected. And my father said, you know, this is a real dump. And my mom said, you know, to my father, you brought me to this place and you, you told me it was going to be great and it's a dump um so his sister my aunt told him look my younger my oldest sister is about your age a few years younger she just got married to a lawyer in minneapolis minnesota mm -hmm. um you should go visit her she's more your age 
and you might like it there more than you would like in New York. So, of course, it's in the summer of 1972. They get on a plane, they go to Minneapolis, they land Minneapolis. Minneapolis in the summer is gorgeous, it's beautiful, it's 10,000 lakes, it's great. They go on Lake Minnetonka on the boat um, with my uh, a cousin, with her husband, and they have a great time. And fell in love with the place. They fell in love, it's beautiful. My father thinks it's like Poland, my mom thinks it's like Romania. <laughs> Um, they have a couple of drinks. They go to Lord Fletcher's, which is a place on uh, Lake Minnetonka. They have a great time. And that's the last they remember of the United States of America. And they end up back in Israel at the end of 72. In 73, a year later, we had a war, the Yom Kippur War. Um, my father had, had an accounting business. And as he was gone for about six weeks, six months, due to the war, uh, the war goes on. The war ended up after a month or two. but. To put everything back takes time. So he, he was frustrated by that event. And he went back to the last place that he remembered that was nice, which was Minneapolis, Minnesota. Was it, was it heartbreaking for him? I'm assuming, he, was he a patriot? My father, yeah, it was heartbreaking for my father and more so for my mom. Um, and they went back to Minneapolis. They stayed there for 10 years because the quality of life in Israel was quite good. They had friends right. that they grew up with. And then and they left when they were in their late 30s, early 40s, and they went to Minneapolis, Minnesota. Minneapolis was great, you know? It was a great place to grow up, one of the best places in the world. Yet they always thought that Israel is a better place. You know, when you come from Italy or from Israel, Mediterranean, you always think back home much nicer. So did they have kind of like one foot out the door at all times? They had regrets, and after about a decade, they went back to Israel because we had... So where were you? They left us. We were in college, oh, and wow. we stayed in Minneapolis. So you were about 20, 21. I was 20, and my sister was 18, and we stayed in Minneapolis, went wow. to college, um, started college. My university took about five years to finish through the Institute of Technology, Environmental Design, and Architecture. Yeah. And I stayed in Minneapolis, and I worked in Minneapolis. Was that was that a... Was that, a, was that a, like a difficult time for you when your parents went back? You were, you were a young man in school. It wasn't. I, I never saw it as difficult, no. I never saw it as a difficult time. On the contrary, I saw it as an opportunity to grow and be more mature. I saw it as an opportunity also to spend more time on what it is that I love to do, right? which was working construction, uh, working in the field. I uh, was trying to build little models in architectural offices. Uh, tying railroad ties and working in landscaping. I was part of the environment that I like to be in. And, and Minneapolis was home for me. I liked Minneapolis a lot. I was there from sixth grade, yeah. junior high, high school. Every summer I would go back to Israel for camp to be with my cousins who were my age. Um, so it was nice. But Minneapolis is Scandinavia. You know, it's not like Eastern Europe like my father thought really? it was Poland or Romania. It's very cold in the winters. Right. And it, uh, and you have to love it to live there. And as a young individual, as a young adult, it was a good place to grow up. So, you know, I think I just want to make an observation that I, I feel that most people, when they've lived their whole lives with their parents and their parents would leave, when I asked you the question, kind of, what did you, you know, how did you feel about that situation? And you didn't think, you didn't seem to think it was a negative situation. That kind of natural positivity it kind of, it, um, it, it's really like, I see it in you now. And a lot of people that would have affected them in a negative way to have that comfort of their parents, whether it's financially or whether it's just emotionally having, you know, your parents there who raised you to now leave at this kind of pivotal age at the age of 20. But for you, it was this just natural, you know, you looked at it positively saying, oh, now I have more time to explore my interests and to do the things that I love. Yeah. So it sounds to me like that's, is that natural or was that just you've always been that way it's do you have to work on positivity it's interesting it's natural in the way that i perceive life right i perceive that as my parents having an opportunity to go back to where it is that they love to be and it gave me an opportunity to stay where i love to be and i looked at it as a positive experience for both of us and back then you know we didn't have the portable phones it was right. you pick up a phone and you speak to each other once a week or so. 
And so it was, I felt it was a positive experience for my parents. It was a positive experience for me. I liked it very much. And independence, I think, is very important for each individual to learn as young as possible. I agree. I believe that, you know, when my son touched the oven and burnt his hand, even though it was extremely painful and had big bubbles, I felt that those kind of things in life teach you quickly and quietly um, how to be careful and how to observe the positive in things. How was, how was your, like, how did you know you had to go and do a higher education and study what you study? I mean, were you involved in architecture or I guess in construction prior to being formally educated? So I studied in, I went to high school. It's interesting, that's a good question. I went to high school in a school called St. Louis Park High School, which is a public school in Minneapolis. And I had a teacher, a very good teacher, who taught me drafting. Mm -hmm. Back then we would draw by hand. Right. So drafting 2D, drafting 3D, and teach you how to do that. And the teacher told me, you know, you're good at this, and you should go on and continue to draft and paint. And I was good at that, sketching, watercolors, and I, I didn't. Naturally, you were just good at it. Naturally, I was good at it, and naturally, I see things three-dimensionally, and I am a lefty. Okay. And what happens in reality is that I didn't really, at that point in time when I was 17, 18, I didn't know what an architect really does on a daily basis versus what an engineer does on a daily basis versus a contractor. This, I just didn't understand the, 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 the responsibility within the American structure. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's evolutionary because to be an architect and or designer in the days when the Sistine Chapel was being built by Michelangelo, you do everything, right? Where today you still do everything, but everybody has their own specific yeah. responsibility. And I was good in math, so I was accepted to the public university, which is the University of Minnesota. Were you, were you a naturally gifted student, or did you have to work at it? I was naturally gifted always with numbers, mm -hmm. n with math, not, and with philosophy. I love philosophy, and I love history. I love that kind of, I love that kind of science. I was never good, because I spoke multiple languages, I was never good at reading or writing a lot. I was, in order to handle, to handle the language, I think in English and I express myself best in English. Although my vocabulary arguably is limited when I see my younger son who goes to Columbia <laughs> University, you know, his vocabulary is so much more sure. enriched. Yet my point of discussion has always been verbal. Yeah. And math is something that I, and numbers is something that I do understand quite quickly and rapidly. And my ability to draw and understand things on the left side versus the right side and the right side versus the left side of the brain has helped me. It's the combination of being analytical and also understanding the art. The art, the history, and therefore the people who created it. And it's important to understand that in people because mm -hmm. everybody's different. Uh, and, and they're different within countries, they're different within cities, they're different within neighborhoods and suburbs, they're different in the, in the family. I have two boys, same, you know, mother, same father. They, Very they're, different. They're completely different day and night. And it goes back to the Bible, to the biblical days, when you have two brothers and everybody, an individual, two sisters, and they're completely different. And that's what makes the world go out because one person, and you have to find and capitalize on the strengths of each and every individual and understand their weaknesses and support them at that. And everybody has strengths and everybody has weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And those strengths and weaknesses is what it is that I try to look and see and seek in people, whether they are people in my family, people who are my friends, people I work with, uh, people I meet on the street. Um, it's just being able to understand it. Your um, your parents did they want this for you? Did, how were they supportive of you choosing this career path, or did they want something different for you? My parents originally wanted my father would have liked me to be an accountant. You know, when I went to school in St. Louis Park High School, people said you don't want to be an architect, or even I started pre arc. I was in pre arc. You don't want to be an architect. Architects don't make any money. And it's true. It, people who told me that were honest and truthful. You want to become a lawyer, an accountant, a doctor, 
something that has more stability. Um, regretfully, uh, it's, it's what I want it to be for some reason. And nobody missed. Sorry, regretfully? What do you mean regretfully? Uh, regretfully, I did not want to be what they wanted me gotcha. to be. <laughs> I wanted to be an architect. And it was something that kind of naturally evolutionized itself as I found out what an architect does. And within the architecture field, there's a lot of things to do. I, I speak well. I could have sold marble and stone. And I have a GC license. I could have been a contractor. I have an interior design license and I have an architecture license. I like to study all those before I render a decision. So before I decided to really first and foremost be an architect and my designs and the way I, I think, the way I provide values mm -hmm. is really I provided its architecture inside and outside. Um, it's not just the space inside. Right. It's not just this room. It's how does this room relate to the outside, to the natural light? Oh, it's faces north, it's indirect, got it. There's an outside area that you can sit and have something to drink or you can have a private conversation. So the indoor and the outdoor, I believe that architecture is nothing more than a backdrop to the natural environment. I think that the natural environment is the most important thing that you can do. And when you reflect back into the, if you study the history of architecture, whether it's Chichen Itza or whether it's the pyramids or whether it's how the, um, the Acropolis was built on top of a hill it makes you approach to the top and then you wow by, by standing there, then you start to get into it. And then even then the architecture is, do, do I taper the columns to reflect back on the perspective? And all those details come in and minutia is that most people never ever understand and or entertain. It's, uh, you're very passionate about this. Do you think that, do you think that your passion for this, as, you, as your passion evolved, as your knowledge escalated over time, do you feel that that's also a contributor to your ongoing not just ongoing success, but your ongoing interest to continue yes. in this field. Yes. So that's important, right? Yes. Like success, it's success is people define it whether it's financial success is just a byproduct. Right. Um, healthy family success is 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 more important. But I re I recall back, you know, I used to have a video camera that I would record everything on, a little Sony, and even on the honeymoon in 1993 when we went to Italy, my wife and I. You know, I have the recording some places. She says, because I touch the buildings, right? I touch what does the stone feel? And she goes, you touch the buildings more than you touch me, <laughs> right? And, and you never think about it, but it, when somebody says that, it just shows you, number one, what they're thinking, how they're thinking, mm -hmm. how they're observing you. You have to be fully analytical and observant of, of those kind of thoughts and statements. And it's true. I've always been like that. And I remember places and spaces back to when I was eight, nine, 10 years old. I remember the smell of the earth when the, it rains, right? When I was a little kid. I remember where I was and what I was wearing when I was walking when I get to those specific spaces. Yet, if you ask me what I was wearing in math class or something, I don't remember. But those, you know, playing soccer in the, the, the dirt, which is reddish, which is how I am. Yeah. When the rain hits it, it has a certain smell and that's where the citrus groves grow, you know? And then you go to, places like Italy or Spain and they have similar sort of soil and you and it rains and you get that smell again it ties you to nature it ties you to the environment and I think that that is a very healthy way to live wherever you are I think it helps you mentally uh, mm -hmm. socially physically to be in tuned with nature once when once you finished school right once you were done um, with your formal education did you, you didn't, did you work for someone or did you immediately go into I always it? worked. I always worked. For someone, I mean, as opposed for someone. to. I've okay. always worked. I worked in high school um, in Minneapolis, in, in Israel. I was a flower boy. Right, you were saying, yeah. Um, and when I came to Minneapolis, Minnesota, I couldn't work till I was 15, 16, 17. I worked in St. Clair gas stations pumping gas, which is interesting because in Minnesota it gets cold. And so sure. you have a certain dress code and mannerism. It's like a full service gas station yes. and you were pumping gas. Pumping I, did, gas. I, did the, I did that when I was a teenager. Do, changing the oil, checking yeah, the oil, yeah, I changing did that too. the brake fluid. Um, and at the same time, I would work in restaurants. Uh, I would work in uh, El Torito's Mexican restaurant opened up in Minneapolis. I worked there as the bar back. What, what was motivating you to do all, like to consistently be working throughout the span of your life? Like, did you ever feel like taking a break? No. I w couldn't. Where did this work ethic come from? Well, if I would study and I would go to school and I would finish my homework and there was nothing else to do, 
TV was not something that I would be passionate. Like watching Bonanza on TV or Sesame Street, I watch it once or twice and then it was boring to watch. I would want to be part of that scenario. Otherwise, I'm not interested in it. So watching is not enlightening to me. Participating, doing. Participating, doing. Working in uh, a restaurant. And then at night, they, would, they had these night shifts in hotels I would work at the Hopkins house or the Sheraton in uh, I one, Highway 100 in St. Louis Park. I would work the front desk, but the night shift. Mm -hmm. So the night shift would start, I don't know, 7 until 2 uh, a.m. And it was in an eight-hour shift. And I would work the night shift, and then it would be good. I would see people coming in. I would see people coming out. Um, because hotels used to be very busy in the day, but at night they were a little bit quieter. And then somebody would come in at 2 o'clock and then wait till the 7 o'clock, which was like the grave shift. Mm -hmm. I would work the night shift. And you would see, you know, the hanky-panky that comes in at night. <laughs> you would see the people who go to the restaurant in the hotel, right? You would see that kind of... We, there was an Elvis Presley show, right? You're talking about Minneapolis, Minnesota in, in the 80s, right? mm -hmm. in the late 70s. You, there, and I would see the people who would go in, right? They would come in and how would they leave? And after they had a few drinks and, and their activity between them. So it was, it was an interesting opportunity to observe people. You've right? always been really curious. I've always been observant of people. Okay. I uh, go to parties, I go to dinners and so forth, and I'm very good at having one-to-one -one conversations. And I'm good at public speaking, mm -hmm. but I am not, you know, I'm, I'm more of an observer okay. there than a participant. Well, it looks like it's, it's served you well. It helps to observe people because then you can listen more, you can hear more, you can smell more. Mm -hmm. You can talk less, right? That's why we have two ears, two eyes, and two nostrils, and, and only one, one mouth. One mouth, right? yeah. That we I've... have to do two things with, breathe and talk, and hopefully Correct. we talk less. Yeah, so, okay, you know, once you, you had to make a transition, you had to make a transition from being an academic to being in the workforce. So you transitioned from that to, and you did you work for an architectural firm, or did you immediately open up your own firm after you graduated? Oh, no, I worked for uh, landscaping construction companies. And not then, even architects. Not even architects. And then I figured out that um, I don't want to work outside because it's too hot. Like outdoors, you mean? Yeah, like we okay. would drive in the truck yeah. and cut the grass, and then the grass would get your white shoes, you know, all no, we green. Can't, we can't have that. And railroad ties, you know, would move them around, and they would pull you back. And it's hot, and you would do it all summer. and. At lunch, at breakfast, you go and grab a couple of coffees at, uh, at the 7-Eleven. Then you go have some lunch together. And yeah. then you finish work at 5 o'clock. You're ready to pass out. You sleep until 7. You go out for two, three hours. But that's what motivated you to open up your own firm? No. What happened then is I figured out I want to work inside. Okay, so your motivation to open up your own firm was because you wanted to work no, indoors? No, no, no. I wanted to work inside. So then I got a job in an architectural firm. Okay. And then you sit inside. There's heating. There's air cooling in it. It's important in Minneapolis. It's much when, more humane. It, <laughs> it's more civilized. More civilized. More yeah. civilized. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened is, but still, they didn't have any work for me as an architect. So I worked making models, doing you know 3D models, uh, okay. doing uh, when the houses were under construction. I would shovel the snow from inside the buildings. Um, when they couldn't find the pipes that were buried by the snow, they would come to my class. Uh, and say, where is the sewer pipe and the water connection to this house number 15 that we would do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously building in Minneapolis is different than building in Miami, but that's what I did. I worked in the architect's office. And for, I, for how long? Um, through college, which is about four years. And once I graduated, I continued to work full-time for a firm called Cunningham, John Cunningham. Um, and then which became a big firm. It was a small firm, mm -hmm. but he is a Harvard grad Rhodes Scholar, and he was very influential in my career at a pivoting point where I graduated. And if you can imagine, I was graduating university and I had a teacher called uh, Parker. And Parker was had a big business and he was a teacher. And yeah. John comes in, John Cunningham, tall guy with, you know, uh, uh, very Ivy League bow tie, mm -hmm. 
and he says to Parker, says, who's a good architect you got? And it's just 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. Studio is wide open, cross-ventilated, Minneapolis, and you're drawing. And he says, that guy and that guy. So he comes to me and talks to me, and he hired me. I was employee number nine. Um, and now the company must have hundreds of people. Okay. Right? Um, but that led me to understand. And he said, John Cunningham said, you know, you should entertain the motion after you graduate from college. I didn't graduate from college um, to also go on and get a master's. So to apply in architecture, yeah, to apply to specifically to Harvard. That's where he went, GSD Graduate School of Design, and so I. But I was working throughout college, mm -hmm. so I cu I accumulated hours of work in an architect's office and in the field. So when you apply for license registration, um, you need to have work experience, and you need to have an education. Mm -hmm. When I graduated, when I was twenty four. By the, age, by the time I was 25, I was able to sit down for the registration exam in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and take the exam, which is a nine-chapter uh, exam over three or four days. So it was after writing that exam that you went to work for this gentleman? So I worked for this gentleman after graduation yeah. and while I was studying for the exam. So the bottom line is yeah. that I worked while I was going to school, okay. to university. And that accumulated the hours that I needed to sit down for the exam when I was 25. I met the head of registration in Minneapolis, Minnesota, for the state of Minnesota. His name is Lowell Torseth. Mm -hmm. Lowell, and you remember the name, a big Marine crew cut. He said, listen, you have worked all through college and you have decent grades and you've received good awards. So you should continue to study for the registration exam and take it next to get year. your master's degree. He was pushing you to your to master's. To get your license. To get your license. I got okay. my bachelor's in environmental design. Then I got my bachelor's in architecture. I was graduating and I was going to go get a master's. Okay. At that point, he said, Lowell said, listen, you can sit down for the exam if you have enough hours, but you don't have enough hours yet. You're 24 now. But if you continue to work for a full year, you can sit for it next summer. Mm -hmm. So you graduate in the summer and you study from this summer until next summer, and then you can take the test because you'll have plenty of hours. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. I worked for John Cunningham. Everything was good. Everybody was happy, and I continued to work. The interesting thing is that that allowed me to sit down and take the exam. And because I was still in the mode of studying, and I didn't go out to the field and start to work and go get married and, and run around and whatever it is that I need to do, it allowed us to really create a, a thought process to focus. And I would go at night after work and I, we had study groups. And these study groups were individuals who were married and older. They yeah. were in the late 20s and early 30s and 40s. And so it really motivated me to take the exam and study for it and focus on it. Kobe, did you, during this time, I mean, you're, you're a young man and you know typically, young people, they have a lot of distractions. So it sounds like you were super dedicated to your career and to, and to progressing. How were you able to, I don't want to say avoid distractions, maybe, maybe you indulged yourself in those distractions and you, you found that balance. I just found for myself when I was, you know, kind of chasing the party, then the the other part of life was getting away and then when i was you know super focused on my my progress and my career then you know the, my social life would fall off were you striking a balance or were you solely concentrated on your career the party element was there i grew up i i i don't smoke pot i don't do coke and this is in the 70s and 80s when a lot of people did it freely sure and back then arguably it was safer than it is today because it was more natural Today, you don't know what you're getting in there. Um, and I grew up with people like Prince in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We used to ride motorcycles together. We were the same Sorry, age. Sorry, with Prince? Prince, the musician. So you grew up with, with Prince? Yeah, we were the same age group. So my best friend, Troy Frank, used to be a very good drummer. And my dad had boutique stores that we would work in okay. Minneapolis. We had a few of them. And so next to us was a club on the corner. It was called... Um, uh, what was it called? First, First Avenue. 
Okay. And First Avenue is if you watch Purple Rain and they're all up there like this. And we were one of the people in the movie, right? Because <laughs> Prince, who was very smart and very in, hardworking and yeah. also very intelligent and had a great voice. He, my best friend was in the music business. So a bunch of musicians that were coming out of the Midwest, Iowa, Wisconsin, North, South Dakota, and, and Minneapolis was a hub. Minneapolis is a very liberal cultured community, mm -hmm. very sophisticated with very, very strong people and families live there. You know, you go to school with people such as Pillsbury and Cargill, okay. Archer Daniels, Midland, Honeywell, IBM, 3M. So you were kind of in that, were you like in a group of, a, you know, from like affluent children, like children from affluent families? Like within? Yeah, yeah, but you don't know about it. In Minneapolis, it's very low key. Nobody wears Rolexes and right. Everybody drives the same pickup trucks and the same SUVs and so, so forth. was it a bit of a culture shock when you came here? Where everybody's it's always it was always a bit of a culture shock when you come to the East Coast where there's Los Angeles and you see the 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 Bugattis and Ferraris, you know, on the street being sold at Rodeo Drive where you go to New York City and you see so many people of so many cultures and so many languages speaking, you know, and behaving in such a different manner. Or you come even to Miami where it was a bunch of old folks from the Northeast rocking on their chairs on a fixed income, um, you know, living their last years of life. Right? Yeah. Or Cubans walking the street with um, no shirts on and, and nobody speaks any English, right? And so you see, that I'm talking about Miami in the 70s and 80s when I would come and visit my parents. So wh where did you start the firm? Did you start the firm in Minnesota or you started the firm here? Oh, no, no. I got licensed and I worked for Cunningham in Minneapolis. You're, you're licensed in multiple states. I'm licensed in most states in the United States of America okay. and other countries. Yet, I, I never intended on opening up my company. What I did is I came to Miami. Yeah. After, while I was taking my license, um, I had a job offer to work for an architectural firm in Baltimore, Maryland, mm -hmm. um, to work on a project called Cocoa Walk. How, I mean, we're t when, when we're looking at from a career perspective, working for an architect versus having your own firm and designing a thousand projects over two decades f like we're it's a different league financially i'm assuming when you're an employee completely you know, different i right. would have been uh, when i was younger and i thought if i ever make 80 or 100 thousand dollars a year i'd be a very happy camper right but what happens is that the perspective of what inflation and what relationship to money is and what it takes i, I had no such knowledge at that point in time or full understanding it took a while to have that understanding. Well, especially when you come to a, a place like like Miami, because I just experienced it myself coming from Canada, right? I mean, in Canada, there are a lot of wealthy people, but it's nothing like it is here, right? So you, did that change your perception of what success is when you came here and you're seeing like every other car is a, like Ferraris here are like Honda Civics and people are living in 20, 30, $50 million homes. Like, uh, it, it didn't change my perspective. It made me acknowledge the reality that you have people here, and you always have people like that, that want to show what they have done. And it comes in different stages in life. You have people who want to show it when they're young to show how advanced they are. You have people who, who all of a sudden wake up and they're old and they buy the convertible that they cannot get out of. Or you have people you know, who just recently got divorced and they're out and about living the life that they never lived when they were younger. But for you, you were already married when you moved here? Yes. No, no, I was single. So you met your wife here? I met my wife here in 1993. So was it? Was 1991. It, nine, 1991. And what year did you move here? 1988. And again, you were, you were working for someone else. You didn't have the firm yet. Yeah, I was hired by a British firm. Right. That was working in the British West Indies, St. Lucia, Grenada, Mustique, St. Yes. Caicos, Jamaica. We built all-inclusive resorts and hotels in the Caribbean from the late 80s to the early 90s. There was no lending going on. But you were here, you were here in Miami. You Lincoln were in Road, 925. You, right, you were, saying, you were saying at the beginning, right. So you're, okay, so then you, you meet your wife. I guess when you came here, did you find it, did you find it, I guess, demotivating? Or, like, was it scary? I found it inspirational. You found it inspirational? I found it inspirational because I thought that the tropical, I'm a, I'm a nature guy, right? So yeah. I, I thought that driving, my, my favorite time, and it's, I love to drive over the causeway, over the water, and to Miami Beach or to Miami. I like to drive over the water and see the views. I love to drive north and south on Collins Avenue at sunset, you know. 
uh, especially in the 70s when I would come here. I graduated high school in 81, but mm -hmm. my parents were here. And I, from Israel, they moved back to That's what I was going to ask. Okay, so. So my parents went from Minneapolis to, to Israel. Israel. Israel has changed. They don't like it quite the same as they remembered it when they were younger. Right. They went to Miami. So then it was Miami for they them. They stayed in Fort Lauderdale. Because most people from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they'll tell you, you should be in Broward County or Northward. You should not go so what they call south of the Broward County line. Right. This is in the 70s and 80s. And I remember our neighbor across the street from Minneapolis, Minnesota, I told my old man, I was outside mowing the grass. He told me, ah, you're going to move to Miami? Okay, good. And the kids are going to stay here? Yeah, 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 okay. He goes, don't move south of the Broward County line. And my dad goes, what's that? He goes, when you get there, you'll figure it out, mm -hmm. but don't go south. But when you think about it, those are strong statements. When I came to Miami, when I moved to Miami after I graduated college in 1988, yeah. I just wanted to be in Miami. I love the architecture, the tropical architecture, the historical Maimo architecture, which is kind of like Bauhaus. It's kind of like the white city in Tel Aviv of 20s, 30s, 40s, curvilinear streamline. Um, very much Art Deco um, was very it's on that important. on that note with Art Deco. You had a lot to do with this whole Art Deco situation. Yes, I love Art Deco. I love historic buildings. It ties no, but me there's back. specifically a region. I was reading this about you. There's specifically a region here that you played a huge role in in reviving. I, I, the, most of the projects that were smaller were done in South Beach, right? That's where I started the Clevelander, and uh, we did uh, the Tropics, and we did the Edison and the Breakwater. But really, the buildings that bigger statements were done were done in the Maimo district, which is mm -hmm. a little bit further up. It's the Faena district, or it's the Fountain Blue area, or the Seacoast Towers, right? And we were always, I was blessed to meet uh, an architect by the name of Morris Lapidus. When I started to work here in Miami, I met him in 1994, 1995. We mm -hmm. spent time together. We got to know each other. And, and just like I'm talking to you, we had strong dialogues. Um, and I like having strong dialogues with people who are opinionated based on fact and history. And, and so was he. And so when I met Morris Lapidus in 94, uh, I had a project, uh, in, which was Seacoast Towers. And Seacoast Towers was a compilation of three buildings. Mm -hmm. Two of them were built, 5101, 5151, Collins Avenue on the ocean, were built by Morris Lapidus in 1962, the year I was born. <laughs> and so when the developer said, oh, you know, we're looking at a bunch of architects, and I was a young guy in Minneapolis. I was in my 30s. And um, they had a big vision. It was the largest real estate transaction back then in 1994 um, that they bought from the Moss family, from Stephen Moss, who is the owner of the Fountain Blue. He sold it for $94 million dollars to a group of um, Italian family, a group with Namura Bank as the lending mm -hmm. institution. And they were talking to a number of architects and I was the Johnny come lately. But I went to the building and in order to get a copy of the plans. And so the front desk said to go downstairs in the, ba in the garage as an engineering maintenance. I went there and there was a gentleman, very nice gentleman um, named Hans who grew up in Austria. And I lived in Austria. I studied monasteries and cloisters around the Alps in my um, a junior year of college of uh, going through architecture school. Mm -hmm. The third year studio, you travel abroad. I traveled, uh, studied monasteries and cloisters around the Alps. And we were living in a castle, Schloss, outside Vienna on mm -hmm. the Danube, which is called Petronel, which is an old historic Roman aqueduct and uh, a castle on the Danube. So, and he was from outside Vienna as well. I would take the train from Vienna to Petronel. We knew the area, so we spoke about it. And so he, this engineer, mm -hmm. built a building with Morris Lapidus and the father of Steve Moss, Alex Moss. He built the 5151 Collins Avenue and now the building. So he says, these are the plans. I said, great. Do you have a copy I can have? He says, no, those are my originals. They were signed and sealed by Morris Lapidus. You can take them as long as you bring them back to me. I said, no problem, I'll bring them. He said, okay, good, good, thank you very much. I leave and I take the plans with me. And what I did is I measured the square footage of the building to mm -hmm. see how much is available for development on the site. And back then you measure by hand, right, with a little red pencil. And I measure and I figure out that there is square footage left over to build. Um, and it's big, it's, it's big projects and there's available square footage left over. 
So I go to the head of the building department, head of planning and zoning. His name was Dean Grandin. I said, Dean, you know, is my math okay? And Dean says, yes, your math is okay. Here's a letter certifying your math. We checked it. Have a nice day. Um, I get a phone call from Felipe, who was uh, the managing director. He says, listen, Kobe, we can't go with you. You're too young. You just started in Miami. How did you overcome that, obje uh, that objection? Uh, I said, listen, I can't overcome that. I can't. So I said, okay, if things change, you know, you call me back, I'm here. I'm assuming the story ends with you getting the project. Uh, not so quick. <laughs> what was interesting is that people, when they're forced to do something, yeah. then, and they have, as I call, you know, an, a day of enlightenment or a moment of enlightenment, yeah. then they think twice and three times about it. Felipe was not a stupid guy. He's not a stupid guy. And he thought about it. And what happened is that um, time went by. And time is the most valuable commodity. And what happened is the plans that I had of Morris Lapidus in my closet, I went back to see Hans. Hans was no longer there. The people who bought the building, let him go. He was the one who was most knowledgeable, most experienced about all the buildings together, knew them inside and out, they let him go. Shows you how people, when they make change, changes are not necessarily smart. Right. So I go back with the plans, back to my closet. I put them in there. A month, two months go by. Felipe calls me up. He goes, Kobe. Oh, so when he calls me up, he goes, you know, so regretfully, sorry, can I get the job? So oh, it's too bad, you know. I just did the math on it. He goes, what you do on the math on it? I said, I, I, I wanted to see if there's any FAR left. I said, yes, there's FAR left. What's, sorry, FAR? Floor air ratio. Okay. Meaning they, it, there was available square footage to be built. Okay. Not much, about a 200,000 square feet. Sounds like a lot to me. It is when you make a hundred, but yeah, even more so today than ever before. But what happened is that he says, okay, bye. And then he goes, he goes, yeah, but Kobe, we're just going to take the apartment buildings. It's apartment building, multifamily rentals, and we're going to convert them to condos. We bought them for $100 a foot. We're going to sell them for $200 a foot. Something happened along the way. They discovered they're not making much money. The sales are not so good. Yet, if they had new product, they would sell it better. He calls me up and says, you still can get that square footage? I said, yes. He said, did you check with the city? I said, yes. Do you have proof of it? I said, yes. He goes, can you come see me? This is Friday evening. Yeah. I said, sure. So I stopped by and I show them and that's when they gave me the project. And we went ahead and did a new tower, new glass tower on the ocean there. And Morris Lapidus, who was the original architect. Would you consider that kind of like like a pivotal moment for you? Was that a breakthrough? Was that like a big kind of a big break? Or it was at that point in time, you don't realize it, but it's a major break for you to become involved in such a big project. At such a young age. At such a young age. And also work with lending institutions and developers who don't know so, so what they're doing. So were you strategic about leveraging that win? to then continue to build? I wasn't strategic about it. I was always willing to assist individuals who didn't have the full understanding. So when Felipe calls back, I have it. I could have said to him, no. I could have been, you know, I, I could have treated him many different ways. I could tell him, you know, you treated me like crap. I'm not gonna, you threw me by the wayside, right? You owe me, you told me you were gonna give me $5,000 for the study I did and you didn't pay me, right? But instead, you need to take it into a positive manner. And you know, it's kind of like an American mentality where there's a baseball game. Mm -hmm. You gotta give people three strikes and then they're out. You gotta give people two strikes to burn then the third time. That was out. gonna be my next question is how do you prevent yourself from being taken advantage under, of? Under European and other countries, it's, it's a soccer football mentality. You, you hit the ball, you score, that's it. You're right. in or you're out. Here, no. In America, I do believe, in the United States of America, the way the business operates, you need to give people, and I do that throughout the world. I do give people. You do that with your employees? Everybody. Two strikes, you're out. And it gives you a sense of stability and continuity because you don't judge people at that moment in time. You give yourself the time to think about it and to judge people properly. 
Kobe, tell me about tell me about the time like when you realized what this was going to become. Like the, the organization that you have, the amount of work that you do, the amount of responsibility, the scale, the current scale, like this building that we're sitting in that is your building and that houses your 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 organization. At what point did you understand where this was going and what this was going to become? I don't think that I ever understood. I think it's purely evolutionary on a daily, daily basis. It's, it's been progressing in a linear manner or was there an exponential curve to your progress? There were big hits. Yeah. September 11, big hit. Hit Phone, negative or positive? Negative. The phones don't ring on September 12. Quiet, like this. And you're carrying overhead? And I wasn't worried about carrying the overhead because I'm not, I never believe in getting big loans. I believe in being a cash business. Yeah. I don't believe in overextending myself. I believe in uh, getting my own funds and financing myself. I learned the real estate thought process um, from people who develop condos and develop, develop affordable housing and develop hotels and deliver, and, and deliver you know, commercial buildings, um, storage buildings. I, so I understand that thought process about time and money. So Okay. Was it a scary time for you, September, like after September 11th? September 12th was an interesting day. COVID hitting United States of America and the whole country, like Israel, shutting down completely. Right. Yet Florida staying open. And I personally have lived through pandemics. Um, Prior to this one? Yellow fever. Right. Um, malaria, all kinds. Of, I, I travel in Cambodia, Vietnam. Yeah. I take you know, before you travel to those countries, you need to take shots. I, I work and I travel to Angola and Africa and I blue, black measles, like so many names I don't remember. So describe, describe to me like, I guess, a big win that really changed the landscape of your entire business and just your life. Like at what point did you have like this life-changing experience where you understood that, and just, I mean, to be really frank, where the amount of money that was coming in was just life changing where you, you, you didn't have to think about money anymore or not that you don't have to think about it. We always have to think about it regardless of the amount of wealth we acquire. But was there like a pivotal moment where you looked at your wife and said like, holy shit, like we made it. No. Cause you never think you've made it. Correct. And my desire to spend or expand has never been about anything materialistic. Um, it's always been about using it. It's like I travel a lot around the world and people say to me, and my wife is in Morocco now, right? And uh, she's in Marrakesh. And I was supposed to go to Libya, to work in Libya for Gaddafi uh, just before. I like the way you just drop these things. Yeah, I was hanging out with Prince. I was supposed to work for Gaddafi. Just you're very, before, just you're before very, he got killed. Right? You're very casual about these statements. It, life, you have to be casual. Why? Because I work in Abu Dhabi in Saudi Arabia. I'm building a hotel in Mecca. Which, so Mecca belongs to the Ali Reza family, okay. which is Persian and, and Turkmenistan and so forth. Why does it belong to the Ali Reza Shiite families? Because they have the money. Why do they have the money? Historically, right? They have the Silk Road. So the Silk Road between China right. and Europe passes through Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Baku, and you learn the Ashgabat, eh, Tehran. And that's why people live there. And so they were able to financially support Mecca. Yet the Sauds, Saudi family, which got the whole country because they had the biggest herds of sheep and cattle, they, they were not the landowners, right? They, they were migrants on the land. Right. They would travel. And so what's interesting is that Saud, when he got the country, he went to Ali Reza, said, listen, you keep Mecca, I'm gonna have the rest of the country, we're gonna protect each other. So if I wanna build a hotel as an Israeli Jew mm -hmm. in Mecca, yep. which is Ali Reza, my sponsor is Sarah Ali Reza, so she is a family that is an architect interior designer that can be my sponsor. In Saud, in the rest of the family, Saud, the kingdom itself, my sponsor is Johar Al Saud, who studied architecture and worked with Norman Foster. Mm -hmm. Yet, if I'm going to build in Mecca, and the contractor who's the developer is Bin Laden family, right? And we are working there. And September 11 happened in two, whatever September 11, 2001. Mm -hmm. 
I started working in, in Abu Dhabi in 2004, 2005. I started working in Saudi Arabia in seven and eight. In 07 and 08, the market was crashing in the United States of America. People are walking out, mm -hmm. Lehman Brothers with boxes, and we're watching CNN. And everybody's telling me, look, Obi, your country is shit. Your country, the economy, they don't know what they're doing, right? While oil is at a hundred plus dollars a barrel. So they're living the best life. Right. What happens after a few years, it catches up. The United States starts to come back. The economy goes down, oil goes down, and, and the whole, it's the circle and cycle of life. And that's why I like growing up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We have Four Seasons, and it's not the Four Seasons Hotel. <laughs> it's the Four Seasons, and it lets you go through the cycle of life. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, what's, what's next for you? I mean, you mentioned you're 60 years old. You just turned 60 in November, right? Yes. You've got your two sons. Yes. Um, and they work here with you, don't they? Well, they're not architects. One wants to be a real estate, is in a real estate broker, yeah. and he works in real estate. And the other one wants to be in theater and mm -hmm. acting. And they're both quite good at what it is that they do. And I believe in letting people pursue what their vision and their thoughts and dreams are. And the architectural business is run by very capable individuals who have been with me for years and decades. And they will and shall continue to run this company um, when I'm gone, um, one way or another. How do you reconcile growing up um, and having the very, very humble beginnings that you did and essentially building your life on your own, um, on your own efforts? And being that person who's accomplished what they what you've accomplished, how do you reconcile raising children to make sure that they don't, not that they don't, that they appreciate? I think this is like a this is the type of question that I ask myself with my kids, and I think it's something that you know is a, is a topic that parents consider all the time. How do you reconcile being where you're from, doing what you've done, and having children and keeping them hungry and keeping them appreciative and grateful for what it is that they have and making sure they're not soft? So, Do you, is this something you contemplate? Yes. And I think if you don't contemplate it, you have problems and issues in life because you need to provide the next generation following your footsteps the ability to do what it is that you're able to do, which is essentially fish for yourself. I can give you a fish. Yes. But regretfully, I'm not doing you a favor. Arguably, I'm doing you a disfavor. I'm if we give you a, lo a lot of fish, you're going to get fat. I'm a big fan of the analogy of give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, feed him for a lifetime. You got it. Now, when you grow up in the Midwest, they teach you, put the seed, the corn seed in the ground. By the time you, the, the, the seed becomes uh, the, 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 the final bushel of corn, there's a period of time and weather and a lot of things that can go up and down right, right and wrong. It is important to do that because if you can fish for yourself and you can grow your own corn, you will then have your own independence to do what it is that you desire to do and what it is that you are on this earth to do for yourself and for the community. I truly believe that the more we help people to do it, the worse we make them. And, and we're ta you're talking about your kids right now. I'm talking about my kids. My kids, I'll give you an example. I used to travel to Abu Dhabi or wherever I was working, Russia, Romania. I would try to make a point to take the, always take the red eye back. I never fly days, I fly nights. And I would fly nights on the red eyes from wherever I was and land in Miami at 5 or 6 a.m. Go home and drive my kid to school. And if I can drive my kid to school in the morning, because when you wake up in the morning and there's kids and as you go through teenage and so forth, you are a different person each and every day. You have a, a relationship with that individual. Sometimes they don't like to talk, we don't talk. Sometimes they like to talk a little, we talk a little. Sometimes they, like about, they talk about stupidity, but sometimes, and usually, they hit the nail on the head. And that's what you're there for, to spend that quality time with them for that 20, 30, 40 minutes that you're driving them to school. Key time, because that's when they just woke up, it's fresh, they're alive, they're awake, and you drive them to school, and then they do whatever it is in school, and to pick them up in the afternoon is not as important 
as it is to drive them in the it's morning. It's incredible that you're saying this because this is exactly how I live my life. I, I drive our three sons to school every morning, and then we have nannies picking them up in the afternoon. Yes. So in the a.m., when they're fresh and thoughtful is when you want to talk and be there for them. And a lot of things can happen. I mean, I can give you experiences. We have a short podcast, but it, 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 it changes and dramatically improves their life. But I'm, I'm still not getting what I'm, what I'm trying to extract from you, the wisdom that I'm trying to extract from you. Um, how do you make sure that your boys turn into strong men like you without having to suffer and grind the way you did? I think that, the, the and I'm not throwing your kids under the. I don't know. I mean, no, I've no, met no. your son once, no, so don't. I'm not making. I'm not making assumption. A, stop. Assumption is 100 correct, and you hit the nail on the head. I like my grind. I enjoy my grind. I wouldn't do anything else except my grind. I think that my boys see that in me, that I do what I love, and I jump out of bed every morning, and it keeps me healthy and happy, and also by definition also gives me the money. But the money, as we said before, is second. It's not even secondary. It's fourth line. But it lets them see that I do what I love and I love what I do. And therefore, I'm good at it. And that's what they do on a daily basis. And that's all. That's the best thing I could do. Now, is it a problem? Yes. Uh, these phones that you have in your hand mm -hmm. and the jewels and the smoke and all the vape and all that nonsense is a problem. You know, it's a really, really big problem. But all I can do is on a daily basis, especially on vacations and so forth, is, is be with them, not necessarily preach to them. Something happens, and it can, my, something happened bad to my son this past weekend, indirectly to one of his friends who owns a business, and I don't say nothing, and he thinks about it, and the next day he comes to me and gives me the whole approach yeah. of what the issues are, yeah. which are so truthful and honest. I just don't even think about some of them. And then I give him some other things to think about that he didn't think about. This is, and he's how old? 27. Okay. 20, oh, he's 26. He'll be 27 in July. I mean, he's young, but he's a man already. He's not, yes. he's not a child anymore. Yes. No, no. He has lived on his own in Australia. He's lived on his own in Boston when sure. he went to school in Tufts. He worked for two years for Toll Brothers, you know, cleaning out the sewer pipes. He went to Columbia, studied master's in real estate. Fine. The other one, too. He's a, he's a hard, hard grinder. And they're completely opposite. Um, one is a social butterfly, and that's how he makes his network. And the other one is not like that at all. He's small and happy to be writing his essays and his theater, right? It's a completely different, yet they get along very well. Arguably, the, re the reason they get along so well is because they're completely opposite. Mm -hmm. so, and, and so there's no even competition. But what is it that w to answer your question specifically, and I don't know if I have the right answer to, to that, but I think that being on them and being present when you're present and setting that example showing them that you love what you do and showing that right it's yeah. not just you know it's like if i'm stopped at a red light and a guy comes and asks for money and i don't give him money my son would say why didn't you give him any money uh i don't want to give him a fish the guy behind me is going to give him another fish and he's going to get fat and lazy he's going to come here every day and just ask for the fish right the next day comes another guy and he's washing the windows. I give that guy money. Go, why'd you give him money? Uh, my window was dirty. He saw it. He washed it with clean water. It wasn't garbage water. He took time. He cared. I gave him five bucks. Why'd you give him five bucks? Because when I deliver the flowers, somebody gave me five <laughs> bucks. It comes back. It comes back to that. It's in your brain. It's inherited. It's DNA. It's tattooed in your brain forever in perpetuity. Kobe, if somebody wants to succeed and they need a starting point, a young person, I have a lot of young people come to me. I actually had a, somebody yesterday who came to me. His mother called me and asked me if I would mentor him. He's 21 years old. Young people in today's day and age, what would you say to them when they want success however way they define success with financial health family what is it that young people have to do today to achieve this from your perspective the common denominator that i see it with everybody um with everybody is grind you're not you can be the brightest i'm not, i was not the brightest in my class what if you're not talented enough there's no such thing 
What if your ambition exceeds your talent? It's a question I often if ask. If your ambition is over your talent, then your ambition is not correct. So you should adjust your ambition to your um You should understand your ambition and why you're ambitious to do that, and then you'll be talented enough to resolve it. You need to understand your ambition and then do it. And what you'll find out in life, your ambition is met through people who come to you. And I'll give you an, an, an example. I had no ambition to go to Abu Dhabi. Makes sense. Two engineers from Georgia Tech showed up in my office, highly intelligent, came to me and said, we want to take you to Abu Dhabi. They're from South Lebanon. And you're an Israeli in all of this. And they knew everything about me when they sat down with me, and I knew nothing about them when I sat down with them. And just for, the, I mean, just for people listening who, who may not understand that there is, you know, kind of this uh, political, um, I don't even know what you want to call it. I don't want to get political on this, but there's obviously a disagreement and there's animosity between these nations. There, there has been extensively over the past yes. years and decades. Yes. Yet you, oh, if you study history, you'll also know that Jews were inherently part of the community in, in, in Lebanon. They were part of the community in Iraq. In Iran, they still are. Well, but before before the conflict. Well, before my wife's family is from Egypt, for multi generational, and and sometimes through to politics and statements, people separate themselves, and divorce, and sometimes they come back together. Mm -hmm. And these guys came in and they said to me point blank, they knew who I was and they wanted to bring me to Abu Dhabi, and to be not only a design architect but to be an architect registered there, and it would take time, and. I went on their promote, on their thought process. I checked on it, I double checked on it with friends and family, but it, the ambition was not there. The ambition and the desire was to be an architect. The ambition and the desire was to be a good architect, to create unique statements each and every time. Mm -hmm. Because I believe the buildings are like people, meaning your component and your parts, the heart, the lung, the bones, the structure inside. Uh, the kishke, the guts, the way they work, is substantially the same with all individuals. And then on the outside, we're completely different. Well, that's the architecture. But then when you talk to us, we have a different thought process and different social behavior. Right. That is the soul of the building. That's the emotion that the buildings can procure inside and outside. So that's what we design. That's what I design about and design for. And that's unique and different about what it is that I do every day. It's what I love to do. Ambition has to relate. You know, when you watch about Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant, mm -hmm. um, their, their grind is extremely strong. They had some talent. They developed the talent. They made it mature and grow. And they use brain power with it. They're all very, very smart. They know how to use it at the right place at the right time and get, make the right shot and win the game. Well, let me ask you, would you say that would you say that realizing your ambition has more to do with effort than with um, skill and wisdom and thoughtfulness? Wisdom and thoughtfulness come from experience and time. Correct. It comes from a lot of time and a lot of experience. But if you're younger and if I'm in my 18 and 20s, I would study and I would learn the history, natural history. For me, it was helpful. The philosophical history, the history of civilizations and people, all civilizations and all people. Um, and the minute you have that perspective, your ambition is in check. Your desire is in check. Your desire to be popular is in check. Your desire to speed down the highway at 180 miles an hour is in check. Your desire to overeat is in check. Your desire to overindulge on the beach and get sunburnt is in check. Everything is in check if you have a full understanding of who you are and where you came from and where you're going. Now, some people get it through reading the Encyclopedia Britannica like I did. Some people get it through reading books. Some people get so it you read the Encyclopedia Britannica? I used to, I enjoyed it very much and I used to read it when I was a younger guy, younger kid from the age seven until I was 11, 12 for a long time, yes. Again, it's that, it's that uh, it wasn't curiosity wasn't the word. What was the word again that you used? It wasn't curiosity. I said curiosity, and you corrected me earlier. What did I say? I, I've forgotten now. We'll have to wind back the tape. But it was... Um, I, I, I always wanted to see what's going on in all right. these places. You know, when I met Prince, like you said, Prince was a kid like me. 
Yeah, single mother, no father, riding motorcycles. We had the same. You obviously knew him before he became famous. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, were yeah. you were you close with him? Not so close because I don't think he was really very close to many people, but we were close enough because we both rode motorcycles and we the motorcycles we I was a Yamaha, he was a Suzuki or something, the rice burners we call them, right? Those are the Japanese motorcycles that we would have in the 80s. And with the little windshield in the front to block the wind because it gets cold and the mosquitoes would hit you, right? And yeah. there would be speakers in there so you can hear music. But he was very talented in music and I was, and my best friend Troy was very talented in playing the drums and he was very good. But nobody knew what Prince would become. Nobody. I, I didn't know. Did anybody know what you would become? No. I did not know what I would become. I'm just... I'm just, as, as my sons tell me, I'm just a redneck from Minnesota, you know, and they go, and I go, why do you got, they go, that's a gopher. That's the mascot <laughs> from Minnesota. And when you think about it in retrospect, that is what makes and breaks you, right? I mean, it's like, I, I gave you an example. I was sitting with, in my office. And this is after September 11, right? And this is a 2007, eight. And the economy was crappy. Mm -hmm. We started a project in 05, 06. It was a Marriott in Miami, Miami International Airport. It was a compound that Bill mm -hmm. Marriott owned. And he was selling it to Thayer Development, which is owned by Pillsbury, the Doughboy, right? Got it. So I get a phone call from a guy called John Pillsbury. I never know him. How you doing, Kobe? Good, good. I'm in my office, big conference. You know, you can hear speakers, people. Um, I got your phone number in the office, not even my mm -hmm. cell, uh, from my nephew. He went to architecture school with you. Sends you his regards, said good. He goes, listen, we're looking to buy uh, the Marriott in Miami, and you're the architect on it, meaning it was a, a campus of about 400, 500-room hotel. We're expanding it to 900-room hotel. And we had opposition from the neighbors, the city of Miami. So, you know, he tells me, I'm Mr. Pillsbury, you know, and you have some environmental cleanup, you have some zoning issues. Um, he wants me to go hard, meaning non-refundable in 30 days. Um, what are your thoughts, you know, because I said, what's your concern? He goes, Miami, you know, it's Banana Republic. It's a third world country. <laughs> and that has how we have been perceived for a very, very long time. Not, not anymore. Potentially by less people today than before. Um, but at the end of the day, and, and I think you are correct, um, but I think that what has happened is that I said to him, yeah, go ahead. He said, you know, he goes, can you give me a gopher warranty? It's not even a guarantee. It means nothing. I said, yes, I'll take care of it. Did it, got the permit, the contractor built it, finished the hotel, got a TCO, opening, you know, it's, everybody's running around getting all the dust. Just for the people who don't know what a TCO is, it's a temporary, temporary certificate, certificate of occupancy, occupancy which building. I know very well now. For, so we can you close the loan. Yes. And make a long story short, Mr. Mayor at himself shows up in the Lincoln Continental. He gets up on the stage and he says, I opened up this hotel here in Miami in the 70s. And everybody told me it was going to be crap and the economy in Florida was crap. And I can tell you for the past 40 years, it's been nothing but a blessing. And I think that this opening will be also very successful and the hotel will be very full. Thank you very much. Everybody's clapping. He gets off the stage. He's a short guy like me. And uh, he says, where is that architect with the cheese, fish, Kobe, carp name, you know? <laughs> and the lady who's from one says, this is Kobe carp. She says, oh, very nice. He goes, thank you very much for expediting the matter with Mr. Pillsbury. So you're most welcome. He says, anything I can do for you? I said, yes, love to take a picture with you. Take a picture, and he smiles. So most people, when you see a picture and they're smiling, it's good. You know, there mm -hmm. was a good vibe at that second. And that's what we did, and that made it all worthwhile. And so do I know where it's going? No. Do, look, Prince, I know, was very clean. He was not a drug dealer. I didn't do drugs. Uh, we had, I had two drinks, and that's it. He died by accident, you know, in Chen Hassan. Um, and it's regretful. And Were you ever in say. touch with him after he became very famous? No. No, once I left Minneapolis, regretfully, we, didn't, we would go our own separate ways. Of course. Ways. If, uh, if he would have been alive and I go to one of his concerts <laughs> here at Hard Rock Stadium, and then I would see him and, um, and you know, we'd hug and, and 
kiss and you shake hands and move on, take a picture to get move on. That's our life, you know. He was a hardworking, uh, creative individual in that order. And, um, and, that, and that's what we had a common denominator. Amazing. Kobe, I want to really thank you for taking the time. You've provided a ton, a ton of Anytime. value. Anytime. Come back audience. more often.